Holy and loving God, we thank you for your word that challenges us in life. Humility is a difficult thing, Lord, to incorporate into our lives because so often we think it's about us and our needs. Help us to navigate your word for our our hearts today that we may truly see, know, and experience your truth in our hearts today. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know, we've been kind of doing a song uh, in starting these sermons. Two weeks ago, we did uh, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and last week we did Drop Kick Me Jesus Through the Goal Posts of Life. Now, we didn't sing that because that's not one of them country songs you well know. But today, the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, is a great uh, basketball tradition in our country. And so I've recruited a couple of whistlers here who are going to help us whistle the Sweet Georgia Brown song. So... Uh, They're going to whistle through it once, and then we're all going to whistle too. So we'll get into that basketball spirit today. Kelby, brave Kelby, (laughs) will whistle it. (laughs) And after we go through it once, we'll all whistle it. All right. We gotta clap first. Here we go. Ready? Everybody now. Whistle along. Look at that, huh? Good job, everybody. So we're now in the basketball spirit here, and uh, we have been looking at sports as a metaphor to help us uh, reflect on what does it truly mean to continually deepen our walk with God and Jesus Christ. Uh, two weeks ago, we, we used the baseball metaphor to help us reflect on a ch- Romans chapter 5 where we talked about endurance uh, produces character, character produces hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us. Uh, Last week, we looked at Ephesians chapter 6, where we talked about putting on the whole armor of God. Much like a football player has all their equipment, uh, we talked about how we put on the whole armor of God, and that one of the critical, very critical pieces of that Paul tells us is the power of prayer. How God's prayer, how we pray protects us, but also we invite through our breakthrough prayer uh, God to, uh, to, to break through in our hearts and lives and into the life of our church. Well, today we're looking at basketball, and basketball obviously is a team sport. Uh, usually five players play on a, at a time, a five on five, and there's also usually some bench players. And so today we're, we're looking at uh, the philosophy or thinking about what, is, what, what does Paul mean when he offers this Christian hymn? In fact, this is one of the first hymns of the Christian faith. Uh, this hymn around uh, Jesus uh, being of the same mind as Christ and offering ourselves in humility to Christ. Now, in basketball, we'll see a slide here, uh, there's what we call the triple threat. Now, I forgot my own basketball, but if you, if you imagine as a basketball player, you're an offensive player, 
You can see here LeBron against Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is a defensive player, and LeBron James is the is the uh, uh, doing the triple threat where he's got the ball because from that position he can do three things: one, he can pass the ball; two, he can shoot the ball; or three, he can drive the ball. And so that's what we call by the triple threat, which kind of throws off the defensive player because you're not sure exactly uh, what part of that triple threat the player will use. Well, today I, I thought about that image or thought of triple threat and thinking about how uh, we can incorporate the triple uh, experience of God in our lives today through this particular passage from Philippians chapter 2, which is one of the most powerful uh, chapters because it reminds us again about how much God loves us. How much God loves us and how much God loves us is at the level of of experiencing what we call in theological terms the incarnation. Now the incarnation uh, in just basic terms is God, that God literally comes to be a human being. God loves us so much because we've had this separation from God. Our separation is caused by our own sin, maybe our own ego, our own needs. And that sin has separated us from God. And in the Old Testament, we saw places where they would take, you know, animals and sacrifice them, hoping that that would please God. Or there was a place in Jeremiah where, where uh, God said, well, that doesn't seem to work, so I'll put it in their hearts. And yet, even then, at times, we failed to be followers of God. Ultimately, God thought, well, then I will send my son. A part of God comes to earth and as Paul describes for us, empties himself. So we are to take on what we call the Jesus attitude. The attitude of Jesus, who literally leaves God. And it gives us two examples of what it meant for God to come to earth and live among us. First, he gives us the picture of humility, of being humble. Now, we all know that that's not an easy word to live out, is it? I mean... There's a song, you know, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. And, you know, those, we, we, we think about that. I mean, it's that tussle, isn't it, in our lives as a follower of Christ that we always think we're right. We, we know what's best. And yet we're reminded that God literally came to this earth, loves us so much, became like us in human form, lived a life of humility, offering self to others in service of God. In essence, it says that Jesus took on obedience, faithfulness, obedience to God. And in doing so, shows us a pattern, a way of being a follower and disciple of Christ, which literally means we, we give ourselves away for others. Now, John Wooden, some of you might know that name, some of you not. He was a great basketball coach in high school and college, led the UCLA Bruins to multiple championships. Uh, but he was not only a coach, he was a teacher, and he really prided himself being more of a teacher than a coach. And this is a great quote that he, he shares. He says, it's amazing how much can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. It's amazing how much can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. Paul in this passage talks about that oftentimes our tendency is to our own selfish motives, our own needs, our own direction. And yet if we truly incorporate the Jesus way, the Jesus attitude, that attitude would be one of humility being humble in the ways that we relate to one another and care for one another, not caring who gets the credit, and also reminding us that we are to be faithfully obedient to God, obedient to God's ministry, love and, and corporation into our lives, and so we just turn around and reflect that to others. Now, we're not perfect at that. We're, we're going to fail at that, but that's the ultimate goal, to take on the attitude of Jesus. Or as Paul describes it, take on the same mind, same mind and heart as, as Christ. Secondly, the, then that, that Jesus attitude really has to become our attitude of how we live lives and how we experience life. 
You know, they're, if you ask Michael Jordan and uh, LeBron James, you know, how they won championships, these guys are super sauce. I mean, we're talking out-of-this-world basketball players. But when they were on teams, when they would score 60 and 70 points, they wouldn't win championships. They would always lose to a team, a team where everybody offers their role in unison together to create that championship winning experience. They'll immediately tell you that when they try to do it by themselves, they always seem to fail because it was about them. I remember in one championship game, Michael Jordan was always known to want to take the last shot. And they were needed two more points to break the tie. And what did he actually do after a 10-year career? He didn't take the shot. He literally passed it to someone else who did. And they won. It took him 10 years to come to that realization. You know, if we just think about those two guys, what does it mean for us as everyday Christians? We always lean on the next person. We always offer ourselves in unison to the team. If we have the attitude of, it's about me, or will I start, or will I be the one that uh, gets the thing rolling or the credit, if we have that kind of attitude, we are missing what God calls us to. That Jesus' attitude of having the same mind would be our attitude. Asking the question, what can I do to make our team better? How can I make our team more successful? And being faithful into God's call in our lives. You know, that almost translates into a life of a church. And how we work together in ministry. Is it about my needs or my preference or my importance? Or is our focus truly on those who are not here? those who need God in their lives. That's kind of one of those delicate balances, isn't it, you know? Because we sometimes think that membership has its privileges. But really, membership in the community of faith saying, I don't have any privileges. The privileges are always to the other. That we completely offer ourselves and be of the same mind as Christ. Now, I think the most powerful part of this passage, not just the Christian hymn that we just talked about, but is the first four verses where Paul talks to us as a community of faith, because in the Philippian church, uh, there was some division, and so he, he wants to remind them to stay unified, and he writes this letter to them from prison, so, you know, he's concerned, and writes this letter to them, and he says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. That's a powerful message for us to always consider in our relationship with God. How can I make another experience what I've experienced in the power of God's love? How can I make a difference? How can I get in the game? There's a story a basketball coach was telling all the players at a practice to uh, get the ball, each one have a ball, and go to the spot where they're going to shoot from the most and in a game so that they could kind of practice that so that when they got in a game situation, they had practiced enough to shoot the ball. And, you know, some went to the corner, some went closer to the basket, some were around the free throw line, others were in that three-point line. And a guy on the team, for a joke, who was basically the 12th man on the team, he went over to the bench and sat down and he was taking his shots from the bench, you know, to try to give a little joke that where his spot's going to be is pretty much at the end of the bench. And they all got a laugh out of that. But sometimes I think that's what happens to us as Christians, maybe, huh? Uh, we sit on the bench thinking, well, we're just a bench player. We're not bench players. We're all called to get into the game. Uh, one of our staff members was over at Lowell, as I said earlier, and a child says, do you have a mentor for me yet? 
there's a desire to be connected. And God calls upon us to maybe stretch ourselves, to take on the same mind of Christ as to humble ourselves in service to others, to connect maybe with one child and make a difference in that child's life. The basketball team, the coach had been at the school for 18 years. They'd come so close to winning the championship. And eventually, finally, they won. And, now, you know, it was, it's great, as the coach said, to be on the winning side. You know, there's nothing like winning the championship and being carried around the floor. And the team is excited. The fan base is excited. Everybody's excited. They'd worked so hard for 18 years to get to that point. Well, a couple months later... He was going through some statistics on his team, and he noticed that one of the players had only played for like 45 seconds in a regional game, was ineligible because of grades. Now, the coach was the only one that knew this, and so he had to kind of think through. He said, for four days, I was depressed <laughs> because, you know, I could not, couldn't say nothing. I, I just knew that we had to do something. And so as he thought about it more and more, he, uh, he finally came to the decision to turn in their team and report that they had an ineligible player who had played, which then meant they lost their trophy, they lost their championship, and they had to return it. When he gathered the team together to explain uh, his actions, uh, Coach Stroud said, you know, you got to do what is honest what is right, and what the rules say. He said, people forget the scores of basketball games, but they never forget what you are made of. People forget the scores of basketball games, but they never forget what you are made of. Put on the same mind as of Christ, who emptied himself, who was God. God come to earth, to show us the path of the Christian faith and way. That is one of humility and faithful obedience to the love of God in our lives. May it be so in our journeys of faith together. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we're grateful uh, that you called us to be a part of this team, your body, the body of Christ, but you give us an, uh, an image, a picture, a way that we all have a, a role, a gift, a place to reflect the power of your love for us. Oh God, you have literally bowed to us, which just seems impossible to our minds, and yet in the power of your holiness coming into this earth, you call us to a pattern of humility and faithful obedience and love. Guide us and bless us in our journeys, in our community of faith, that we may truly be your people in the world. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.